Okay, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really exciting to hear all these wonderful presentations today and the discussion. So uh, terrific. And uh, hello to all of you out there. This is the first time I present uh, virtual. Um, so this is a new new era. I have no, um, uh, no financial um, interest or conflicts to disclose. So, okay. I want to uh, first uh, do a uh, uh, thank you to the Prevent Cancer Foundation for allowing me to present our work and also to the New Mexico Department of Health uh, Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, our UNM uh, University of New Mexico's uh, Center for Collaborative Research and Community Engagement, which is where I'm housed in our program. And of course, especially in this effort, because this is very much, as everybody has been talking about, a very collective effort to all of the uh, team that you see on uh, this poster, but also to the peer educators who are not mentioned there, Berta Campos, Blanca Cadenas, Carmen Gloria Schleiter, and Florencia Altas, and of course, Kathy Landvaso, Patricia Corona. Those are all peer educators slash patient navigators who help to implement this program. And of course, Dr. Belinda Vicuña, uh, who uh, assisted me in providing uh, the data for this. So thank you so much. And of course, our other folks, uh, Yesenia Hernandez, who helped to coordinate this project. don't have access to changing. Can you give Just, me access to... Um, click in the center of your screen on the slide. Oh, okay. No? There we go. So um, this is our poster, of course, and um, we I will, in the slides, cover some of these um, uh, specific uh, sections and, and highlight some key aspects of it. So um, I'm with the Comadre Comadre program, and our program's um, main focus is to empower Hispanic Latina women. And as you all have heard, we've heard uh, everything from increasing knowledge to navigation, and our program has those uh, key components and in addition to providing resources and um, uh, assisting women around breast health and breast health, uh, breast health and cervical cancer. Um, and we work with women across the continuum, uh, not just um, in screening, but also follow women through their diagnostic um, evaluation and on to uh, treatment and uh, provide support through our navigators and through post-treatment. Our navigators are and peer educators are breast cancer survivors. They are trained to navigate, lend support, uh, and teach uh, our classes. They are the transmitters of our uh, knowledge and education in our community. Um, uh, and so why do we do this? Um, why, do, why Comadre? Why the program? Uh, as we know, and the studies show, despite lower incidence of breast cancer, Hispanic Latina women are still diagnosed at advanced stages. We are continuing to address this disparity in our community of women, and in particular in New Mexico. We are looking at those individual and systems level factors that lead to breast cancer disparities among our women. And we know that, uh, and as has been mentioned, but also in the literature, um, that peer patient navigation, uh, in our case, peer, not just uh, navigation because they are survivors as well, and from the community, but also those community-based interventions are um, effective, and especially if they have apply uh, culturally relevant approaches. Our program is um, in general, but in this particular project, um, comes from that socio-ecological framework, and also it's a community-engaged approach to how we bring breast uh, and cervical cancer education to, to the women. In particular, it also combines the education, as we, um, as I mentioned, as peer-led, uh, but also a com in combination with patient navigation. So at the individual level, we want to, of course, increase that knowledge, change those attitudes and beliefs, and we also address those cultural myths that are very, uh, uh, very present, um, and uh, also addressing it on the interpersonal, uh, peer-provided, 
and culturally um, uh, focused and patient-centered, and then providing support, the women who are the leading these uh, classes and also navigating are women from the community, survivors themselves, and so they are well-respected and well-embraced and received. Our local community partners include um, numerous um, uh, organizations as well as uh, faith-based, especially organizations, uh, community-based organizations that we partner with to bring these classes to the community and at the institutional, of course, healthcare systems such as the clinics that we refer the women to and um, our Mexican consulate, um, Department of Health that we've collaborated, you'll see ahead. Our Breast Health Platica, Platica is in essence a informal conversational style that's used in Hispanic Latino culture. And so it's very appropriate for us when we thought about this project. Uh, now it's um, years in, in implementation, although it has gone through revisions, especially with recommendations, um, that we incorporated this in, in the delivery of, this, of these classes. Um, it, the curriculum is in, uh, has been developed through uh, collaboration with the Department of Health as well as the evaluation pre and post and class format um, uh, collection of data. Okay, so what are some of the outcomes? Uh, from demographics, um, we had um, this, these, the classes are primarily in Spanish. Um, we offer them in English and Spanish, but the majority of the women that have been in attendance are Spanish speakers. They are primarily of Mexican descent and we had 37% of the women had no medical insurance and 34% uh, had less than a high school um, education. Uh, Breast Health Practica uh, attendees, we had um, even the 291 that completed these surveys, but overall 302 women attended uh, these, uh, the classes. And as you can see, um, they were in um, the number of classes that we that were scheduled and the number of classes that uh, uh, attendees that um, that took place took part in the classes. Um, this is key for us: the top myths and also you'll see ahead the barriers. So we still see among the women when they are engaged in these classes, they get to talk, they report, they self-report uh, because it's a very informal setting, and we ask them, uh, "What are those things that um, that uh, you know that uh, that keep you from?" Uh, getting a mammogram or getting a pap test and then all, what are those barriers. So top for these women that w participated in this series were fear of results, uh, fear of cancer, uh, still injury to the breast, uh, the belief of that, fatalistic beliefs that a cancer diagnosis leads to death, and of course the sense that if there's no history of, of breast cancer uh, in my family, I don't, I don't need to get tested. Uh, in terms of barriers, we saw that top barrier was not having medical insurance, um, the cultural um, belief of vergüenza, which is modesty, uh, the sense of being disrobed or taking clothing off, or you know that that very sensitive, personal that women um, have when it comes to undressing and just you know just revealing body parts. Uh, no time for screening the issue of language, and of course, uh, also uh, fear of the mammogram. Um, important for us was looking at, right, did this, these classes make a difference in terms of how the women uh, made uh, informed decisions in the future? Will they get screening? Uh, did they think that this was a valuable, uh, valuable for them? And we saw that there were differences in uh, what they understood um, about breast and cervical and what the peer educators were able to uh, transmit and uh, we see some of that data, especially looking at the cervical cancer screening in the future. Uh, there is still the common belief that uh, breast, that cervical cancer cannot be prevented. So one of the things that we do a lot in these course, in these classes is talk a lot about um, the prevention of, of cervical uh, cancer. Um, and then finally, the, um, the uh, class presentations evaluation, um, we ask the women they complete uh, in the surveys, uh, and this is the data in terms of how they believe that the, present, the um, presentation of this information impacts them, did it impact them in a positive way, uh, will they be sharing this information, 
and of course, uh, overall their experiences with, uh, or how valuable they felt the experience. We, we find um, that um, being able to have the peer educators presenting the information and having a personable uh, interaction with the women in the classes, um, and even the navigators that then when that the peer educators hand this over to the pa patient navigators that because there is so much uh, confianza as we say trust and those bonds are, are, are inherited in how the, the classes are delivered that there's this continuity so I think that's one of the things that uh, just anecdotally that we see that uh, really makes a difference in the women. And then finally, the um, request for navigation. In this delivery of this project, we include a request for navigation uh, form, which the women complete. And one of the things I'd like to highlight is the 31.4% of the women who requested navigation. We see that close earlier in the demographics, close to 37% of the women did not have uh, medical insurance. And what we find in overall in our program, but also in this particular project, that uh, the navigation is very uh, clearly uh, important for the women who are most at need, right, the most vulnerable. And we find that these women have those characteristics not only uh, language but also uninsured and also just uh, as another barrier that I have we have seen over the years of implementing this project is the the idea of not being familiar with navigating the US healthcare system right that is not just I don't it's not just that I don't know how to make an appointment but there are some women that it is very difficult for them to navigate and to understand uh, how things work, I don't know, for lack of a better word, uh, basically in them. So in conclusion, um, what we ha find is that peer-led, culturally competent educational strategies were successful and are successful in increasing intention to seek future cancer screening. Um, community partners are essential. Uh, as I mentioned, no one, you know, um, in this project, but in general, does anything alone. You do it in collaboration and in uh, concert with others and this is a project that has over 40 45 partners uh, in the community from not just the Mexican consulate but other community-based organizations faith-based uh, basically we go where the women are and we get contacted to uh, bring classes um, you know and we will bring classes to businesses during their lunch hour and we bring classes right in our own backyard at the University of New Mexico's housekeeping. We go to the medical institutions and tap into their um, cafeteria workers. So wherever the women are and wherever the coordinators, we can, we can uh, connect that. So that, that knowledge is also uh, across the community. Not, it's, it's initiated by them, initiated by us, but clearly those collaborations are significant that for Hispanic Latinx uh, women, um, that they, uh, there are especially characteristics of some of the women that they demonstrate a need for support and navigation in accessing cancer screening. And then finally, the findings from multi-level community-based education interventions could provide primary evidence, even though there's clearly wonderful programs that have been implemented using navigation, but in terms of just the combination of the application that, that, uh, that is applied in this project, for future approaches and other in other settings in other health behaviors and among other ethnic and racial uh, racially diverse communities, um, and then um, finally just uh, references and then once again thank you so much um, and I'll take questions um, and again this is our presenter thank you so much. Thank you. It looks like we have about two minutes for questions. As a reminder, the raise hand function is available. We also have, looks like, two questions during your section for the Q&A. Okay. Looks like um, Sheila asks, what programs have been found to be effective to encourage testing and prevention in American Indian and Afro-Caribbean populations? Am I on? Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, working in 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 applying this particular um, intervention with those communities. So I don't know if other others from the panel or perhaps others might be able to provide that information. But um, I'm 
a little bit limited there in, in, in being able to advise or, or to suggest. But it's a great question. It looks like we have a raised hand from Erica. I will allow you to speak. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you. I was going to ask in regards to your classes, like what's the content of it and how long are the classes for? Just curious. Sure. So the, we, our curriculum is based on um, the, you know, the latest recommendations. And as I said, they, the, this last two years, um, curriculum was uh, developed in collaboration with the Department of Health. So recommendations and all the, all of the uh, important information regarding what is cervical cancer, what is uh, uh, HPV, a lot of what we heard today in terms of uh, vaccinations, uh, who supposed to, who should get vaccinated, and then also on breast cancer. So we do both English, English and Spanish, and the curriculum is um, both breast and cervical. Um, and uh, what was your other question? I'm sorry, did you? That's okay. And the length of the duration of the classes, please. Yes. So the class, we keep them for two, at least an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And it includes uh, the collecting of the information uh, of the uh, pre, pre and post, uh, pre, and then also the post. Um, our project is under the main campus, University of New Mexico's IRB. And, um, and so um, everything everything is um, evaluated and um, reviewed and implemented that way. And so the women get to read. They do not get to sign, but they read a uh, consent form, basically, that they do not, uh, that they understand what they are completing and why they are completing this. And then, of course, uh, they are also, uh, once they get navigated or they request for navigation, they also participate in an in-person um, consent process so that we're able to navigate them to the clinics and provide the support that, that we do for these women. And that often includes everything from apply, um, providing gasoline cards, uh, visa cards for that initial visit. There's still clinics that uh, charge uh, very low and minimum, but a lot of the women that we work with are not able to make uh, that, uh, you know, that fee, that initial fee for that visit that BCC does not cover. So we provide um, those financial um, uh, support and then also, of course, the emotional support in, in working through that fear if a woman is having a difficult time, uh, whether it's getting a pap test or, or a mammogram. Thank, Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was gonna. Is this one class or how many classes is it in total? May I ask? It's one class per. It's one. It's it's one class at a particular site, and the classes are held in numerous uh, community settings. So we, the, we, we, we are asked to repeat that class, and that class is the same curriculum. And uh, we have had women attend our class more than once. And uh, we may have a site that, because they have so many um, you know, uh, participants, whether it's uh, the mothers at a elementary school that they, they want us to come in in the morning, or a church that um, has different uh, parents, like we work with Catholic churches with their um, children that uh, go for the CDC, the um, communion, um, the classes for communion. So we work with different groups and we may be asked to come back in a week, twice, um, and or in, uh, in a six month or nine month period, multiple times if there are different audiences. So yeah, but it is a one time class for a participant. Yes, good question. Thank you so much for your presentation, Elba. In order to respect everyone's time, we will be sure. moving on to Rachel. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. 
So here we go. So I'm the last presentation of the day. It's probably been a very long afternoon, but uh, a really great afternoon. So um, thank you to Prevent Cancer for having me and having us here to be able to share about our um, really exciting new program out of the New York State Department of Health. And I'm just really pleased that we have an opportunity to share uh, with you about what's going on. Um, let's see. So I believe that was the Elba's presentation, poster presentation, but I'll just, um, just talk you through what to expect in the next 10, 11 minutes. Um, just tell you a little bit about our CPIA, which we call a Cancer Prevention in Action. And so, you know, um, Really, this grant came out of this idea that, you know, despite the many advances in medical care, prevention, purchase, and early diagnosis, the cancer burden really continues to weigh heavily on individuals, families, the community, healthcare organizations, and public health. So we look at policy systems and environmental change by this multi-pronged approach of addressing individual behaviors plus population-based activities that work together to reduce cancer. And so the idea is, if we're talking about skin cancer and melanoma, you know, you, you can tell me to put sunscreen on as much as you want till you're blue in the face, but maybe actually if my local park that I go to with my son all the time offers um, complimentary sunscreen that um, will help make that behavior uh, just more easier, right? The default choice um, the healthier choice, the default choice. Or likewise, um, you can tell me that I need to get my mammogram because that's the recommended screening. Um, but if I don't have time because my workplace doesn't offer it, sort of to Elba's, Elba's point with mammograms and no time for screening, but if my workplace has decided to offer a benefit specifically that says I could use four hours of paid time off um, to go get my cancer screening, also, once again, it's making the um, healthier choice the default choice and the easier choice. And so that's really where a lot of this uh, grant originates from. So once again, oh, can I go back somehow? Okay, great. So, you know, this is really what the framework of the CPIA grant is about. And so we're, how do we build a community that's supportive of change, of cancer prevention mentality change. And so, and when we say policy change, it's not necessarily like big key policy, if you will, of like what you think of with uh, laws and legislation and lobbying, but really more in terms of local policy. So all of our organizations where we work have uh, an employee manual and have rules or all school districts have board of um, board policies. And so this is what really what we're talking about is how do we change the environment, the, um, the workplace, the school, and in supportive of all of um, in support to support uh, cancer prevention. So, and all of these four little bubbles here um, help make that change. So we're talking about educating and engaging our communities, mobilizing them, talking to our decision makers, who are the ones at these organizations who are um, help make these policy changes, as well as our government decision makers. And so ideally, all four of these create policy change. And that's really what our uh, four funded partners across New York State are working on. And so this is a, it's a new procurement. It was a grant out of our New York State Department of Health, um, our Bureau of Cancer Prevention and Control. And to have our funded organizations um, prevent and reduce cancer in their community. And so we released this RFA um, a few years ago, um, summer of 2018, and it's a five-year grant, as you'll see, and we're just finishing up year two of our grant. So in order to meet all those program objectives, our contractors participate in these activities to build awareness of and support for policy change. So, and specifically, they work on um, skin cancer, so melanoma, as well as screening amenable cancers, um, so linking to early detection, and then um, promoting the HPV vaccine as cancer prevention. So those really targeting those um, cancers caused by HPV, such as cervical cancer and more. And um, 
Also within our de uh, Department of Health, we do have a very strong bureau with procurements and grants that work on uh, cancers caused by tobacco. So they do a lot of policy systems environmental change work. Um, so I will just say that um, there are other funded organizations working on cancer prevention with tobacco, but our specifically focus on these. So here are just some examples of what our funded partners do in their community. As I said, they do these community education and public events. They, they're meeting with decision makers and talking to them about the importance of, you know, what is their role and opportunity to help prevent cancer in their community, as well as they're working not only with the sites and partners um, for education, but really saying, okay, if you adopt this policy to help pro uh, promote cancer prevention, we can have, we have funds and resources and materials to help you implement this policy. So as you'll see in the bottom left corner, there's a nice shade sale, um, which one of our um, municipalities had installed uh, to promote shade in their park, um, as well as you can see a few little sunscreen dispensers and sunscreen um, at a library. And um, I think this, uh, the sunscreen dispenser on the bottom right is at a public pool. And so once again, making the healthier choice, the default choice, changing the environment um, by providing you know, sunscreen here or shade. Since this day was all about cervical cancer and HPV, I just wanted to share some specific activities that our contractors were working on regarding the HPV vaccine. Um, while there is no policy ask as part of this grant associated with the HPV vaccine yet, um, they are really working still on that community education and awareness around the vaccine as cancer prevention. And so... Um, uh, there's a lot of resources out there that we found um, in our analysis that for um, pr uh, primary care providers and pediatricians. Um, but we were trying to think of how our contractors could work in their community for non-medical providers. So what is the opportunity for education and building awareness within uh, the school community or with parents or even dental providers? Uh, because we know of the link with head, neck, and throat cancers. So um, they are doing work with college students, with school districts, par parents of adolescents, um, and they're also specifically using this film, if, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's, it's uh, a documentary about the HPV and it follows five women and the effect of HPV and cervical cancer. Um, and so we are, we've asked them to show these, this film within their community. Um, and to, pr to promote and raise awareness. Um, if anybody on the call is in New York State, uh, the New York State Department of Health did purchase a license and a DVD um, to show in your community. So you feel free to contact me if you'd like a copy of the DVD. Okay, talking really fast, because I only have a few more minutes, just an example of some media work. Our contractors, they hired, they pulled their funds together and they hired a full service media company to create some branding and awareness as well as some assets and some paid media billboard sort of materials for that community education. So you can see a little bit um, here. And then lastly, with the results, you know, the, our program began in October 2018. It was a brand new program, a brand new procurement to get off the ground. So, um, but early results have been extremely positive, um, as documented through our performance monitoring, our local level evaluation, and our surveillance. Um, but not included in our calculation is reach, which we define as the total number of people possibly impacted from the policy. And we've just seen uh, just a tremendous amount of reach and potential in children and visitors and patrons to outdoor recreation sites or to outdoor workers and employees. So we're really proud of the work that our contractors have been doing. So some conclusions, as I said, we're, we have some really great results in terms of pa local policies that are passed and community education and awareness and reach. Um, we've, our contractors have really built um, some good um, partnerships with decision makers, key people in their community to be aware of cancer prevention and opportunities that the community has with cancer prevention. Um, and so, um, we've been so successful as we have some anticipated in expansion of CPIA um, uh, 
in upstate New York, or in New York State, excuse me, to continue this work. Um, we've had some really good traction. Of course, COVID is certainly bringing some uh, significant changes to our program, even in ways we aren't really sure how. But obviously, our community education and decision maker meetings are probably looking more like virtual meetings and online presentations. Um, but they are still doing the work and um, being creative and how to stay relevant to continue the message of cancer prevention. Just want to do a shout out to my supervisor, Suzanne, who's the brainchild of this work with our cancer prevention. We have an evaluator. She's our staff member who works on um, evaluating the program success as well as um, these are our four contractors, our community partners who are doing the work in New York. And um, as you can see, some of them are health departments. Others are health uh, healthcare provider or healthcare um, uh, system as well as a local grassroots community organization. You can check out more on um, takeactionagainstcancer.com as well as Facebook. And I believe we soon have a new Instagram page too, but I didn't have that link up there. Hi, Rachel. If you give me one second, I do believe I actually have your poster. Oh, okay. Great. I can bring that up really quick. There we go. All right. Well, there it is. So you can imagine walking down the hallway and seeing me standing in front of this. So here I just, um, uh, uh, yeah, here you can see it all. All right. Looks, looks like we have a couple questions. We have a raised hand. We have about three more minutes for questions. Erica, I'll go ahead and allow you to talk. Please unmute your microphone. My apologies, that was an accident. Thank you. No problem. It looks like we have um, a couple for Q&A. Uh, do I look at them? Oh. Let me, okay. Actually, I have um, some more raised hands. Okay. I have one from Barbara. I will allow you to speak. Please unmute your microphone. Hi, my name is Barbara Schuler, and this whole webinar has been fascinating. I am an HPV survivor. I have also started a nonprofit called VAX, V A X, the number two, Stop Cancer, to bring education and awareness to the HPV vaccine. This is in Alabama. So, um, this has just been a great day. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope some of y'all will, um, you know, maybe tell your patients about our website. Great, thank you, Barbara. Uh -huh. All right, thank you. Looks like we have a question from Jodian. I would like to speak. Please unmute your, your microphone. Jodine, you have to unmute your own microphone. Okay. Is that okay now? Yes. All right. Um, I'm sorry, but her website flashed too fast for me to write it down. And I was wondering if we could see it one more time. Thank you. We can put this information to chat so everyone, everyone can see. Oh, okay. Thank you. Next, we have Victoria. I will go ahead and allow you to speak. Please unmute your microphone. Hi, Rachel. Can you hear me? Hey there. Yep. Hi, Rachel. I have a question about um, the, the, this new uh, PSE change or the new program you implemented in your state. Um, was that October, October 2018 uh, when this program was initiated? Yes. And when was it actually implemented? Oh, well, I'm, so the, the grant year did start October 2018. Um, and so, but obviously the planning started well beyond that in terms of the Department of Health. But it, it is brand new. It started October 2018. Okay, thank you. I was just going to borrow your experience because um, I, I was wondering how long does it actually take for 
a program like get get initiated of course you have a network with you know other organizations like for uh skin cancer you work with local zoos from your uh, poster i saw in some public polls like that um who are mostly who are the um partners or um ally providers or whoever interested in this program in participating for HPV uh, vaccine program. Just curious. Yeah, I mean, to go back to your first question about how long does it take? I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, in some ways, policy and relationship building t can take a long time. And sometimes some of our contractors will approach an organization who will say, mm, maybe not interested right now. And then they might need to circle back in several months or a year or two. Having said so, um, sometimes it goes very fast because of um, existing relationships, because of, you know, we asked all of our uh, partner organizations to our, our contractors to do an environmental scan, which is like a fancy word for saying like research all of the potential organizations or who do you know, or who are your previous partners and do a little research and fact finding on them if they have a health mission. Um, and so, and try to work with them, try to find, prioritize, find low hanging fruit, find people who have an existing organization or uh, existing relationship with your organization. Um, so sometimes it can happen very quickly and other times it can ha happen a little bit longer, but sort of, but because it was a brand new program, um, there was just a lot of awareness raising in the community about, hey, we are the Broome County Health Department and we have a new funded program and we want to tell you about it. So, um, so that also takes some time. And frankly, for some of our, um, our funded grantees, it has taken them a good year and a half, you know, by now. And now they're really hitting their stride in terms of kind of grappling and understanding the concept as well as working with their um, community to kind of gauge, okay, how are people responding to what we're doing? Um, and if not, do we need to change things up or, uh, you know, and keep building on our momentum. In terms of the um, partners with uh, the HPV vaccine, it's a really wide range depending on the, um, the grantee. So for example, one health department is working with school districts um, and you know, having the school districts commit to um, promotion of the HPV vaccine within their school-based health centers, or possibly showing a Someone You Love film uh, screening to a, a group of students, whether that be in their health class or um, after an after-school effort or um, smaller group of students. Um, one organization, one contractor is working uh, right now with dental providers, and so they've um, gone out and they were going to go out to a local dental conference, um, that would, which would have been this spring, but, uh, but obviously didn't. And so doing some awareness and having very targeted messaging about the role that dental providers can offer in terms of, um, obviously they can't administer the vaccine, but they can certainly recommend um, to adolescents or kids who are within the recommended screening time uh, or uh, vaccine vaccine, recommended vaccine age, um, and kind of the link between um, HPV and um, head, throat, and neck cancers. All right, Rachel, thank you so much, and thank you to everyone. Uh, we are out of time for questions. And thank you for joining the 2020 Prevent Cancer Dialogue Part 1.